Well, Metzia daf lamed chet to lamed tet, a sugya that spreads over a wide area. Ownership and hope drive investment. I moridin karov lenichse shavui. Uh, it's a very timely piece of Gemara because it actually deals with, with hostages, with people who've been captured, with people who've been taken, and they've left property. What, what do we need to do with their property? How do we take care of their property? Uh, but the real topic of the Gemara is, is different. You will notice it doesn't take a lot of effort to notice that although socialism was a really interesting idea when it started and Jewish people were taken by it, it makes a whole lot of sense. Share everything. It, 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 it's so beautiful. And, and then it became communism, but the fact is it hasn't worked. Which is interesting, why hasn't it worked? And we look at it, though it's not just, just that, in that, what's further interesting is those countries that have had phenomenal sustained economic growth over, over centuries are countries not only where there's a free market, but they're also countries where there's a belief in God. So if you look at vast areas of the world, either they were socialistic for a while and they're in poverty, or they were atheistic or non, non-believing countries, Africa, parts of Asia, and they too have not flourished and grown at the kind of way, if you look how the United States has grown, if you look how some of the Western economies grew, what was driving that? What was that all about? And 14th century Ritvo will explain it, why, why, that, is, why that is the case. The uh, professors of economics in Ivy League universities have been studying this for, for decades, but if they would learn the Ritvo, they would, they would have it very clear, we would understand exactly what it is. And that's the topic of the Gemara, but as I've said many times, a lot of people are going to be learning Daf Lamed Ches and Daf Lamed Tes today and tomorrow and over the weekend. If you asked people afterwards, you took a survey and said, what was the subject of the Gemara? What is the Gemara dealing with? I think very few will talk about what are the drivers of investment? What are the drivers of economic growth? Because that doesn't see what the Gemara, seem to be what the Gemara is talking about. What the Gemara is talking about is something different altogether. There's a Mishnah on Tav Lamed Ches of HaMafkid Peirot Eitzel Chaviro. A person deposits fruit to be taken care of by his friend. You take care of the fruit while I'm away. Afilu hen avudin. Even if you notice that the fruit is deteriorating, lo yigabahen. Don't touch them. You're a shoyim echinam. Don't touch them. Don't do anything. You're, you're a trustee. Your job is just to protect them. Your job is not to take care of them. And by taking care of them, that you might spoil them in some other way, and then you get into difficulty. Just do what you were told to do. Take care of them. Raman Shimon Gamliel Omer, Mohran Bifnei Bezdin. No, says Raman Shimon Gamliel, they have to be sold under the supervision of the Bezdin, of the courts. Mipnei Shu Kameshiv Aveda Labaylim. The whole thing of Bo Metziah, we've barely been talking about returning lost property. So the potential of loss here, you're dealing with Peirot, you could sell the payroll, you could sell the fruit and, and capture the value of the fruit and then give it back to the, to the person later on. By not doing that, you are not returning lost property. So Rabbi Shimon Gamlin introduces the idea of potential avida. Lost property is not only something somebody has lost, but something somebody could lose and you could prevent the loss. That's also called Meshi Vaveda. That's also called uh, returning a lost property. And as we learned yesterday there's a, a mitzvah Doraisa in, in our even in Hashovas Gazela, even in returning something that's been stolen, how much more so in Hashovas Aveda, we know that there's a Chi of Doraisa, there's a Torah law that you've got to return it. This fits into that requirement, says Rabban Shimon Gamliel. Says the Gemara, Mid Rabban Shimon Gamliel Nishma, we can extrapolate an interesting idea from Rabban Shimon Ben Gamliel that will resolve a major debate in the schools of Rav and Shmuel in Babylon. What is their debate? Whether Moridin Karov Lenichse Shavui. A person who's been taken captive, or oh, he's gone overseas, he's been taken, he's been held on, on, on charges of tax and he's had to avoid them, be it as it may, he's gone. We have no information that he's dead, but we know he's not around. And he's left property. As a society, what do we need to do with his property? How do, how do we help? And we see this happening right now in front of our eyes. How do we support people? Who've, who've left property behind, people who've had to flee from the south, people who've had to flee from the north. It's the same thing. They're like Shvuyim in their own country. They've been taken away from their home territory in their own country. What do we do with their property? Are, are, are we obligated to help them to do things? Of course we are, it would seem to be. But what's interesting is the question of, can you put a relative into the, into the property to work the property on behalf of the Shavuyim? 
according to Rabbi Shimon Gamliel, you, clearly you can. For according to the Rabbonin, it seems you, can't, you, you don't do that. How do you work that out from the Rabbonin and from the Mishnah? That's the whole sugya deals with that. And then it brings the, uh, the, the discussion. Itma, we learn, a hostage who has been captured. Rav says, a relative can't become the manager of his property. You don't put a relative in. What does that mean? You put a stranger in, rather, or you don't put anybody in? Discussion in the Rishonim. Shmuel says, you do put a relative in. You appoint a relative to be a manager of the property. Rashi says, what kind of relative? One who, if it turns out that this hostage dies, the relative will be the heir. That's who you put in the place, not just any, any relative. Somebody is no, there's nobody closer than him. He is the one who would inherit. He then becomes the manager of the property. Says the Gemara, if we know that the hostage has died, then of course you put people in, whoever you can get to take care of the property. That's something we're obligated to do. But what do we do if he's, could, he, we haven't heard that he's died? He's a hostage. And he could come back at any moment. And we pray and we daven that he'll come back. And w- what do we do now with his property? Rav Rav says, you don't go down. Dilma mafsit luhu. We're worried that the person we appoint as a manager of the property of the hostage will damage the property. He won't take care of it well. So clearly Rav holds, not, not that you then leave it and, and do nothing with it, even though there are some who say that, but Pashtut on the surface would seem to be that Rav is saying, not a, not a karov. Not a relative. Get a professional manager to do it properly. Ushmul Amaburid him and Shmuel said, No, you put in a karov. Kivan da Amar Mar Shamin and Lak Aris Lo Mafsid Luhu. The Gemara says on the next page on Lamateta Mudalif that these people who function as managers taking care of the property of these hostages who haven't yet come back, they are rewarded as an aris. An aris is compensated in a as a percentage of the value he's created. So he gets a percentage of the crop, he gets a percentage of the growth of the field. There's a manager who is remunerated in, in share. He doesn't have an equity share, but he has a share in the profits. That's what we do with the iris. That's how it is. Says Shmuel, so if this karov is being compensated like a, like a partner, like an iris, then what am I worried about? He's not going to damage the field. He's not going to ignore the field. He's going to want to make as much money as he can out of it. So the stakeholder interests are aligned. When uh, I was struggling with this Gemara, I'll tell you right, right away what I was struggling with. Shmuel is right. Shmuel says, that the fact is we say on the next page, that you pay him as a percentage of profits. So, so interests are aligned. So what difference does it make if he's a karov or he's not a karov? If he's a relative or he's not a relative, why would Rav say you don't put a relative in? The fact is you're, you're, you're compensating him in a way that is aligned with the interests of the owner. Why wouldn't you put him in? Why, do, why does Rav say that? I couldn't, I couldn't deal with that. I couldn't really understand that. And then the, the Ritvo came and he said, the Ritvo on Bovamati is very interesting, by the way, because the Ritvo of Bovamati we've only had for about 60 years. The 1962, is that right? Yeah, 1962, the Ritvo on, on Bovamati was first published. It was published in, in England. And I remember when I learned Bovamati, in yeshiva for the first time, it was just after the Ritvor came out. And it was just so exciting, a whole new Rishon that other Achronim didn't know about. So a, a lot was written without knowing about the, uh, about the Ritvor on, on Bov Metzir. The Tur writes sometimes, Ve'yeroyeli, I've got a new Chidush, I've thought of something. And then people say, but the, but the Ritvor wrote it. It's not your, it's not your Chidush, the Ritvor wrote it. But he didn't know. The Ritvor was not available. The Ritvor, the, even, even in Kisveyad, it was not available until very, very recently. <laughs> There was another Ritvor that was, but it wasn't the real Ritvor. It was published as the Ritvor, but it wasn't the Ritvor. And the Ritvor was quoted in the Shita Mukubetza, so we have pieces of him. But it's only now that we've got the full Ritvor, and it's so amazing. So the Ritvor came, we learned together this morning, the Ritvor and I, which everybody, one of us can do. Just what, what a gift, isn't that? You can sit and you can sit and learn with the Ritvor. 14th century Spain. And the Ritvor says, come, I'll teach you what this is all about. Just learn this carefully. And he says the following. From this Mishnah where it says, if, if I've, you've given me your fruit to take care of, 
Rabbi Shimon Gamliel says it must be sold and you must capture the value, otherwise it's a question of Ashava Saveda. Perish Lavshinish Mami the Rabbi Shimon Gamliel de Moridim Karov Tfei Mirachok. It's not coming to tell you that you've got to put a relative there in preference to anybody else. That's not what it's about. I understand that's what you're concerned about, but that's not what it means. All we know from this is that you've got to put somebody in place who can grow the value, who can keep the business going. You've got to put a manager in place. That's all you can learn from Rabbi Shimon Gamliel. Because what does Rabbi Shimon Gamliel say? You've got to worry about potential value. With fruit, the potential value is merely capturing it, not letting it deteriorate. But what if it's a business? Now potential value is its potential growth. And therefore, it's Kameshi Vaveda. If there's potential growth, there's a business capable of generating revenue and growing in value, you can't just leave it. You see from Rabban Shimon Gamliel that Hashavat Aveda is also to, to deliver the potential growth that that item has. And since that's the case, Shamina and Misvara, now use your logic. We learned the other day, you've got to combine the, the source with your own logic. Use logic. Shaoveda hu karov. It's better that he's a karov. It's not that you've got to put a karov. It's just, there's a preference to putting a karov. I can't learn from Rabbi Shim Gamliel that. Rabbi Shim Gamliel doesn't talk about that. But once I've learned the principle of Rabbi Shim Gamliel, the principle is you've got to take care of the potential growth of the hostage's property, not only the potential loss. Because loss of potential is loss. That's, it's Aveda. That's the Chidush of Ramashim Gamliel. It's unbelievable when we understand Ramashim Gamliel properly. Once you understand that, then with your own logic, you know, rather put a relative in. Why? If you just have find a, a volunteer to do it, we don't do that for adults for various reasons. And an apotrupus does it free, free of charge. So we don't do that. The Ibatorat Arisuchi tos haroke had marise ha'ir. So if the choice is now, do I get a professional manager who will get a share of the profits, or do I give a share of the profits to the relative? Who do I put in? Do I put in the, the you've got a millionaire who's been kidnapped, he's, he's a hostage, he might never come back. The son says, I want to take care of this property because one day it will be mine in any case. And there's a professional manager who has a track record of making billions of dollars from turning these properties around. Who are you going to put in? The son or the, or the, or the professional? Karov Adiv Tve. What we learn from here, the Ridvo is explaining to us, rather the, 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 the relative. For two reasons. Firstly, he has a connection to the... Look at the words. It's unbelievable. This could be a talk in business school. The, appoint a manager who has a connection, who has an emotional investment in the property. And he has a potential to own it in the future as well. And then it would just naturally pass to him if we get the bad news that the hostage has passed away. The property all just goes to him naturally. We don't have to get back to Beisdin and have a whole court case. It's the smoothest way to do it. And here's where I want to focus the second reason. Since he has ownership and hope, in the property, he will work it well and take care of it. It's lavod or Rashi uses those words as well. The job here of putting somebody in to, to work it is, is to to Like from like it says in Brachis, means Rashi says in Benichse Shove Shove Shomran. Like, like, like with Odom in, in Ganadin, there are two things you've got to do with property. If I've just given you a piece, of, an object or a lot of fruit, then I've got to be Shomer. If I give you the golden road, Rolex, you've got to take care of it. You've got to preserve it. But like, if I give you a business, you've got to grow it. That's a completely different thing. If I give you an asset, you've got to grow it. If I give you an object, you, you, you protect it. This is an asset. The fruit in the Mishnah is an, is an object. We're talking here about an asset, and the Gemara is extrapolating from the Mishnah that talks about an object to the discussion of Rav and Shmuel that are talking about an asset. But says the Ritvo, the point of a Korov is a Korov has ownership, it will one day be his. And a Korov has tikvoi, he has hope. 
What does hope mean? Hope is tomorrow could be better than today. That's what hope is. That's why you invest. Why would you invest if you don't have hope? Why would you invest if you don't believe tomorrow will be better than today? If you believe tomorrow will be worse today, you sell. You don't, you don't invest. Countries where there's socialism, there's no ownership. And they think that's chokhmah, that's clever. Says the Ritval, you idiots. You've taken away ownership. Where are you going to get growth of value and investment from? And in Africa, there's no, and, and parts of Asia, there's no tikva. There's acceptance, which is a wonderful midah on its own, but not for business. I accept, I accept, whatever will be, will be. But bad news, good news, market's up, market's down, I accept it. And, and the person has this tranquility that he accepts whatever it is. But that doesn't drive growth. What drives growth is tikva. I believe in a Rebbeinu Shalom. I believe in a future. I believe that tomorrow will be better than today. I believe that Rebbeinu Shalom has a plan. As bad as it is today, it's going to be right and it's going to become good. And look at all the Jews who made so many millions and millions of dollars out of buying when everybody else was selling. Because they believed in the Rebbeinu Shalom. They told me in, in Australia, who's from Australia? Anybody from Australia here today? They, they told me in Sydney that Bondi Beach, which is now the, the most expensive area of property, was, is all Jewish. And the reason it became Jewish was because in the Second World War, the Australians were afraid the Japanese were going to come as they did. They came very close and they were going to shell. And where would they shell? They would shell Sydney. And where would be the area? The coastal part of Sydney would be there. So they all sold. And the Jews said, we've got tikvai, this will come right. This is, an, this is a gift from God, that the goyim are afraid of the shelling of the Japanese, and they're running away from Bondi Beach, this is our chance, buy up Bondi Beach. And the Jews did that in New York, and the Jews did that in London, the Jews have done that everywhere, because we have tikva, because we have bitachon. And that's why our capitalism works if we would only do it our way, because it's not un unbridled capitalism. What's the capitalism based on? I have ownership, so I have responsibility and accountability. That's good. And I have tikva, I have hope. Well, why do I have hope? Because there's a Rebbeinu Shalom. If there's a Rebbeinu Shalom, my hope is dependent on running the economy as he wants me to run the economy. Otherwise, the hope doesn't work. You need that piece. Without that piece, you get what we're seeing in the United States today. A selfish generation that's just in the take and not the give. That, that, that then becomes the problem because the tikva, we've lost the, the foundation of tikva. The foundation of tikva is bitachon. The foundation of tikva is emunah, is belief and faith in God. And as the countries of the world have become more and more secular, the tikva diminishes. How do we see tikva as diminishing? No population growth. You stop having children if you don't believe in the future. If you do believe in the future, you have as many children as you can. It's, you, not only is the slowdown in population growth worrying to economists because it, it, it both demand and consu both consumption and production flatten and eventually start falling, and you've got a, an almost irreversible economic spiral, which now they're worried about all the time that they were driving. Small families don't have children, population explosion. They, you don't even have the word anymore, population explosion. Now everybody's worried about the population deterioration. Why didn't you think about that before? Why did you wait until we've got a reduction of population globally and now you wake up and you're worried about it? But there's another problem which they haven't even come onto. It, it's a symptom of lack of hope. And if there's no hope, it doesn't help that there's ownership. You need ownership and hope. Says the Rosh, the Rosh goes further. They both work it out from the Gomorrah slightly differently. The Rosh and the Ritval were contemporaries in Spain. The Rosh came from Western Europe until things got bad there for Jews, and then he went to Spain. But they were both in Spain. They lived at exactly the same time. But I don't know how much connection the Ritval and the Rosh had with each other. But the Rosh says so much so that I believe, based on how he re works through the Gomorrah, that you can't even put an Aris. It's, a, it's only a Karov. You've got, unless there's no Karov. If there's a choice, it's not that a karov is preferable, as you, Ritvo, said. And you gave a beautiful understanding as to why a karov is preferable, because a karov has ownership and hope. But if an aris also, if you, if you align the interests of the aris and you pay him as a share of profits, then, you, then you're okay. No, says the Rosh, you can't put in an aris if there's an alternative. Because with the case of an aris, we're concerned, the chayshinan shema yachsifa karka. The interests are actually not aligned. Because an Iris has a short-term interest. He knows ultimately he's going to have to give the property back. Either the hostage comes home or we hear he's dead and you have to give the property to the, to the, to the heirs. The Iris knows his interest is short-term. So he becomes like the short-term investor, some of the private equity companies, just trying to squeeze as much value as they can in the five years that they're holding the asset. 
That's not what we want. That's what an Aris does. An Aris says, I've got this for a few years. Let me squeeze out as much as I can. Says the Rosh, therefore we don't want an Aris. You want a, a Korov who says, I want as much as I can now, and I want to invest. I want to fertilize the field and plant the field and fence the field and grow the field. I want to invest because this will be for my children in the future. Part of hope is legacy, is continuity. That's what, it, what hope is. If I don't have children, then the hope is very limited. What's the hope for? Eventually, it's, I'm going to die in any case. Hope is part, part of hope is the continuity. That's why the, the faith and, and economic growth are so linked together. Ownership and hope requires a foundation of faith, of, of bitochen. Explain the Rishonim on our piece of Gemara. And that's how we need to structure our businesses. And that's how we need to st structure our our assets, and that's how we need to relate to everything in our life. If we want to do things properly, if we want to invest, the things we invest best in, and here I'm talking not only about investing money, I'm talking about investing time and attention. The things we invest in are the things in which we have ownership and where we have hope that it's going to be better tomorrow than today. We've got to preserve that. And in these difficult times with all the negative news that's going around, our responsibility as the Jewish people is to teach how and why tomorrow will be better than today. And this is a time to invest. This is a time to grow. This is a time to take risks. This is a time to expand. This is not a time to contract. Because as we do that, as we take advantage of these difficult times, with our hope and with our ownership and with our trust in God, the result of that has, over the centuries, been enormous prosperity and well-being for the Jewish people and all who follow that methodology.